in the aftermath, as we transition out of our home quarantine, out of COVID-19, and as global protests circle our globe, a lot of people have been reaching out and asking me, Lindsay, how do I get involved? Lindsay, where should I invest my money? More and more, we are starting to think of where we put our beliefs can be displayed by where we put our money. And so the question is, how do I know which nonprofits to choose? How do I know where to invest that is gonna have an impact that aligns with my values and my dreams for moving forward as a country and as a global community? Well, today I'm joined on the virtual couch by Louise Shernan, President and CEO of GSBA, and I should mention also the sponsor of this show, and by Jason Porter, Director of Education and Programs at MOPA, and I should say, the place where my son wants to go every day and pretty much cries that is not currently open. I felt like that was important to mention. <laughs> Good morning, Louise and Jason. Thank you so much for joining me. How are you? Good morning. I'm doing, I'm doing okay today. It's a sunny day and that feels good. Mm. Um, it's a busy day. It's all these days have become busier than ever, but it's, I think it's, um, it's good to see that blue sky. I, I think it helps lift spirits. Yes. Tell me a little bit more about that, Louise. When you say it's busy, how has the GSBA been navigating this time? Well, you know, I think we are always a very busy organization because we're a chamber of commerce, but we also have a scholarship fund. We work with small business and nonprofits and students. So we're always doing a lot. But we've, <laughs> of course, had to um, change everything in every way we do things. And that started with COVID-19. But, but now that we're also involved in um, really nationally and certainly in Seattle, uh, lots of, of serious racial issues and unrest and, and commitment to want to really address this. Um, there's just layer upon layer of more things to do. And you know, when you're, when you were open in a physical location, you took natural breaks, even if it wasn't a break, you walked into someone's office, you got a cup of coffee, you walked outside, you went to meetings, you took public transportation. Now you just sit there and everything runs one thing into another. Every crisis and every day it's a new crisis as well as your ongoing work and trying to pay the bills. And it's, it is really nonstop. And you can realize you've been sitting and not moving for seven, eight hours. So I think that just the physical stress sometimes of that plus the seriousness of what's going on, I think is a big challenge. Yes, yes. Jason, I see you shaking your head. Can you relate to a lot of what Louise is saying? Uh, yeah. Uh, good morning, Lindsay, and good morning, Louise. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for, for inviting me. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think this has been a, a very unpredictable time and one in which, um, you know, every nonprofit that I know of has, uh, you know, had stressors that were unexpected and certainly preparation among people who are in leadership to people who are um, working directly with the public um, have never really had to face some of the issues that we've been facing, um, certainly with respect to the COVID-19 pandemic, but then layer on top of it, this immense social upheaval that's happening um, in the fight for um, racial justice. Um, and so, you know, I think it's really been a time of kind of seeing, uh, looking in new ways at the ways in which we are responsive to what's happening in the moment and also, you know, trying to be thoughtful and planning for the kind of sustainability that, that we all want um, as, as kind of community organizations and certainly as, as businesses. Yes. Now, Jason, you had said, uh, in fact, that as the director of education programs at the museum that in those first few weeks, one of the huge realization was we just do not have a digital plan that is as closely modeled to our in-person 
plan. Is that right? How have you, how have you made adjustments? Yeah. Um, I mean, I feel like I can speak basically for the entire cultural sector in a lot of, in, in many ways in that, you know, I think most, um, as Louise was saying, like people oriented um, organizations where you expect people to come to your theater or walk through your museum galleries um, or come and eat at your restaurant. Those are all, um, you know, situations that we feel very prepared um, to, to accommodate and to deal with. And we're always thinking about that personal experience. Like how can this hour long visit to the museum impact somebody's life or serve a group of school kids? Um, and, in a situation in which that opportunity of being together in person is no longer available, it was really a, a wake up call around how we think about connecting with our audiences in ways that don't, you know, that are so different from the ways in which we are accustomed to doing it. And, you know, I think a lot of the, um, you know, there was a sort of hopeful period where we were like, oh, this will just be a couple weeks, you know, or, or we'll just get back to business as usual after, you know, a little while. Um, and once it sort of set in that this is a, a you know, a marathon, not a sprint, um, we, we did start doing some deeper thinking about, you know, what are the skills that we need? What are the um, areas of expertise that we need to pursue? What are the ways in which we can kind of approximate some of the things that we so value about our in-person experiences with people and, and try to kind of get up to speed on what that's like in a, in a digital or virtual uh, environment. And so a lot of our time has been spent making that kind of pivot to thinking about, you know, what we do in person versus what we might be able to accomplish um, in these other more, you know, physically safer um, settings. Absolutely. Now, I know that there's a nonprofit leader watching right now. I don't know their name. I'm guessing. Um, you know, we've been now in quarantine for 500 years. Um, and I want to know, you know, both of you are recognized in our community as great leaders that we look up to and that we can go to for uh, advice and for uh, a sense of st stability. But I wanna know that first moment when you realize that it's not just COVID, but then also you're now going to have to be responding to what is potentially a great social uh, upheaval and change and then also, uh, both of your organizations take a very active role in Pride and those celebrations and uh, community support efforts. What are you feeling in that moment when all of that is in front of you? I, you know, I can say for me, I'm always trying to think not what I'm feeling, but what is it the community is feeling? What are the members of GSBA feeling, our students? What is it that we could do that would fill a need for them right now? Um, you know, Jason mentioned the museums. Of course, it's an in-person live experience usually. But for business organizations, by the way, in chambers, networking is also a key part of it. People join to get together and they want to have their after hours events and they have their round tables and they have all these different things. And for our students, especially LGBTQ and allied students who may have little family support or no family support, um, they might not have even a home they can shelter in. And so in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, how do we figure out how to meet these new needs? How, um, the, fulfill some of the old responsibilities, but what are the new ones, uh, even around pride? And even that has been thrown up in the air because pride is a time both for celebration as well as reflection uh, and recommitment. But now it's like, okay, there is, it, it isn't exactly a time to celebrate right now. People are in physical crisis, economic crisis, and there is a crisis of knowing that all of our institutions have really kept most people from participating 
in so many different ways. Um, our black and brown community, certainly the LGBTQ community as well. And so what do you do when there's a, a holiday coming up? And that's probably true of any of our holidays. How do you make that um, without just bringing people down, but how do you make it more impactful and significant? And um, I mean, we just had a great win at the Supreme Court around yes. LGBTQ equality, right? With, uh, for an, an employment. And yet we also know that maybe it doesn't affect everybody. Everybody is still at risk in employment uh, because we've been hearing, um, in, you know, in terms of inequality uh, around income and economics and opportunity. So it's, it is a big challenge to address it and yet help people engage and lift them up. And I think as LGBTQ and other uh, leaders of other nonprofit organizations, we're looking at that. How, how do we do that? So we pivot our programming. We call people more often. Um, we maybe write handwritten notes. Maybe we do things we have slipped on, which could be very meaningful for different people. Um, the Seattle Men's Chorus had, or Women's Chorus, that you could get a singing telegram to your house where somebody, you, for their birthday, you could send, and they'd open the door, and then it'd be a performer or two to I sing Happy that. Birthday. So people are being creative. They're being, you know, and so there's a chorus. That's a cultural institution where you usually have to go there um, in person to sit in a concert hall. So I think the challenge has been great and we're trying to do that. We, we realize we cannot ask for money really. Um, we might be able to ask for emergency funds in certain circumstances. So then we're also behind the scenes struggling with how do you keep on the lights? How mm. do you maintain all your programming with perhaps all of your sources of revenue, either, if not drying up, pivoting in different directions? So uh, the challenges are great right now and yet the need to feel that we have some stability from the organizations we all depend on, I think is greater than ever. Yes, yes. And Jason, can you speak to that in terms of, you know, we, let me say I, often think of museums similar to organizations like the GSBA as a place to gather, to meet, to come together in community how do you, as a leader, all of a sudden realizing that you're not going to be able to bring people to engage together in that way, what is that moment like? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because this is that's exactly the conversation that started to occur when we began to sort of reimagine what um, these virtual experiences could be like. and. You know, it's important to also note that a museum serves a number of different audiences, um, and that includes, you know, the public. It includes um, school groups and teachers and community organizations and performers and artists and local, you know, local teaching artists and people like that. And so, you know, I think what how we kind of narrowed down the conversation was really to think about the authenticity of of experiences for our organization and to you know you know thinking about our mission and our core values and thinking about the ways in which despite the fact that we can't have those in-person gatherings that you're talking about we can't walk people through our galleries to see objects we can't put on a film screening um, in person or have a performance um, there are some qualities of those experiences that have much more to do with, you know, the things that bind us together in terms of connections that, that we did want to retain. Um, whether they were experiences that happened over Zoom or things that we posted on our website or conversations that we got into with people on social media, like we wanted to kind of articulate what those, what the quality of those experiences would be and you know, to your point, it was, it, it became a lot about how do we find communities that can gather together in these virtual spaces. And I'll give you an example of, of one way in which I think we've done that really successfully is like, you may know from visiting that Mopop has a, a horror gallery that um, focuses on, you know, all different types of creators of horror from, you know, 
the very beginnings of Hollywood to up till today. And it's a really fun exhibit. It has sort of haunted house elements to it. And um, it really Perfect. explores I'm like- just, just, yeah. I'm gonna own that, yes, <laughs> that happened. Yeah. Um, and, you know, in our sort of Mopop way, like we explore, like, why do we like to be scared? What, what, mm. what, what do people find appealing about that, that notion of fear? And, um, and so we have this group of people who love to come to Mopop and, and experience that gallery and sometimes watch horror movies or talk about horror. Um, and so a colleague on my team, um, Robert Rutherford, started a, a watch along series that was every week um, we would choose a horror movie to feature and blast it out into the world that we were doing it. Um, he uh, does an introduction. He often has a guest who's either a director or an actor or some like horror expert who um, is really passionate about whatever that film is. Um, Robert does like make your own DIY cosplay. So he dresses like Jason Voorhees or Freddy Krueger or whatever using Q-tips and duct tape and whatever. And, um, and it's been an incredible success. Like we've, we've gotten hundreds of people to, you know, watch on their own televisions, download the movies themselves, but stick around for conversation and commentary um, that's happening throughout the watching of the film. And, you know, it's been, we've gotten, I was telling this to someone just the other day, like the way in which that has become a sort of intimate shared experience has resulted in the museum getting the kinds of responses to that program that, you know, is is so much more intimate and emotional, in mm -hmm. fact, um, because as Louise was saying earlier, like it's such a it's such a difficult time to remember, you know, the the before and what we used to do to kind of sustain ourselves and to and to relax and to unplug and recharge. Um, that, you know, having these types of experiences, I think, really taps into how much people miss those kinds of. Um, in-person opportunities. And this is like an approximation of that, that really, I think, adheres to what we try to do at the museum with in-person experiences, but it's, you know, it's the next best thing given the circumstances. So I think that's where we've really tried to focus is like, what's authentic for us and how can we bring the elements of that authenticity into whatever we're doing in whatever format it, it, it exists in. Yes. Yeah, um, I love that. I just want to let everybody out there know that uh, Robert Redford, the actor, is not who Jason Porter is speaking about. <laughs> Although, if Robert Redford on the Mopop team would like to do a breakfast at Tiffany's hour, I will be in attendance. <laughs> Louise, what were you going to say? Uh, well, I was going to say, in terms of, of how to repurpose and how to bring some authenticity and joy into people is we were about to celebrate and we are in our 30th anniversary of our LGBTQ and allied scholarship fund. Mm. So uh, we invest over $600,000 a year in our students. And in May, on May 15th, usually we gather together in person. They come up on the stage. You know, we stand up, we cheer them on, especially for students who, again, don't have that kind of family support, which mm. is still too many of our students. And it's a very joyous evening. And suddenly, okay, they're all over. They're not in school. They're all in different homes or staying at a friend's house or wherever they're staying. How are we going to celebrate these students? How are they going to feel? They put so much into getting to where they are. So one thing that we did was send out a package to especially those who are graduating this year because of course, no in-person graduations. Yeah. So we sent these uh, beautiful uh, lavender um, mortarboard hats, you know, the mortarboards and uh, with rainbow tassels and then a little rainbow pin that you could use and a card which uh, we took around to several of us and signed them all in person. So someone went to each house and wrote a note and then we had a package delivered to every graduate. So that was amazing. I love that, yes. It was, it was wonderful. And then that evening um, with, uh, with Carlos and Mark from our office, they put together this celebration where over the course of a few weeks, every student was videotaped themselves. Mm. And uh, then it was put together in a collage and we ended up an evening where we got to meet our students 
We had the MC be one of our uh, graduates, one of our students who, who completed their education. And we closed it with a song by one of the students who has a beautiful voice. And um, the evening, what was not only that it was joyous and real and everybody, it wasn't, you know, a big high tech professional production. It was people putting things in from their own cells in their home that we then put together. But it also allowed us, like I invited friends from the East Coast who've never been to the Scholars Dinner because they live in New York and Philadelphia and what have you. Well, everybody, everybody invited their families from all over. So these students not only got to celebrate, but they got to have their friends and family and our donors had to, that could actually watch and see why we care so much about these students. And it, was, it turned out to be one of the most joyous evenings. We could not have imagined how to take it in person and create something that would just fill our hearts. I mean, I think it kept us going for a long time after seeing an evening like that. So you're right, sometimes things will have turned around and the reach that we can now have with people is definitely a greater reach than when things are very local. So yeah. you know, those are the good those are the good parts. Yes. Well, on that, have you uh, seen or heard, I know I have, which is why I'm asking, of some of your nonprofit peers who are navigating this time going, we're going to try to do things exactly how we've always done them. What does that thinking do to you as a nonprofit leader? Well, I have to say, I haven't heard much of that. So, um, you know, I've heard people really, really changing things. I mean, mm -hmm. if you can't, I mean, some people like they still do their networking, but it's all in rooms and on Zoom. We've tried to avoid a little of that because there is so much Zoom fatigue that we want to make sure when we do it, we're doing something special that people want, such like keeping it real, which is, is something that really uh, is different. Um, so I haven't yeah, and it's wonderful. I mean, it's just a gift. But I haven't had actually many nonprofit leaders say they just want to keep things the same. They are all looking on how to really change things around, maybe forever. Some new things might change forever as a result of what we have learned and how we can expand our message. Of course, I still hope we bring people in person because there is nothing like really being able to be next to somebody. Yes. Um, so I haven't, I don't know, Jason, have, have you had uh, nonprofit leaders say they're going to try to keep things the same? Mm -hmm. I, I haven't. Um, I mean, I know that unfortunately there are some places that haven't, you know, had the ability to sustain themselves through the, the pandemic. There are certainly museums that have shuttered and other nonprofit groups um, who are dependent or, or maybe on on less stable footing than an organization like Mopop financially. Um, but yeah, I, I think there, there, I certainly have heard of some organizations that, you know, maybe didn't respond as quickly to the notion that like everything's got to be different and we've got to really pivot into, you know, the new realities to responding to the new realities. Um, and, you know, and there are certainly organizations that were better suited to respond to a moment like this. Either they had a really robust um, online presence already, they had people on staff who had a lot of experience with, you know, doing virtual um, work with the public that, that is meaningful. Um, but for the most part, I think everyone has jumped on the notion that uh, things are going to be different and we have to shift our organizations and our and our organizational thinking and planning in order to respond um, to, to reality. Well, maybe what I have noticed and thank you for that. What I'm hearing is still the buzz of, um, for example, organizational leaders who maybe have always been, I wake up, I get in my car, I go to my office. That's what we've always done. And post this, that's what we're all going to get back to. And there's a different generation within that organization who's going, well, virtual has worked. So why would we go back to uh, nine to five 
uh, 40 hours a week in the office. What do you think about those leaders who are trying to um, plan to go back to business and usual in terms of their people and their teams? Well, I think they're going to have to really rethink that. I, I really do, no matter what they want to say. Um, first of all, the way things were had a lot of challenges. We have huge traffic jams that people spend, I mean, how many hours? Some people were starting to spend uh, an hour each way or more, uh, especially people who felt they couldn't live in Seattle anymore, for example, because it's so expensive. So they've moved south or north. And now with the traffic, that was incredible. Some people had challenges before, even before COVID around childcare. And so what it is, uh, some people have ability issues and suddenly they could be at home where their circumstances can be more comfortable and they could be more productive. So we've actually seen suddenly there is an opportunity to look at your workers as individuals. What do, uh -huh. they, what do they need and how can they then create an environment and we support that environment, making sure they have the right technology and desks and, and things like that. Our budgets might be different. What if we don't need as much space and we could have a much a smaller footprint in that? Now, the, what I do feel though, is those who think they can go completely virtual, I think they're gonna have a challenge as well because mm -hmm. there is something about an office culture and yeah. it is very hard to virtually create a good office culture. Uh, you miss those little interactions or opportunities where people bounce ideas off of each other. And when you ask people why they take a certain job, they, yes, they look at salary and benefits and location, but often it is for the office culture. Oh, mm -hmm. it's not as much in this, nonprofits don't pay as much, but it is so wonderful. We're on something together. We have a mission. We work on something. So I think we're going to come up with hybrids, more flexibility, lower where we invest our money, um, maybe more in our people and less in our real estate. Um, and then really look at how we can meet different needs. Uh, the bosses who were the ones who said, no, you all, we always have to be here at nine and we have to be here at five. Maybe not. Maybe you have people who, who are more high functioning at different times of the day and can do things differently. So I think it'll have plus or minus, but some of those decisions will have great impact because if we have a lower real estate footprint, what's going to happen to cities that have all this built real estate? What's going to happen to the small businesses that depend on the lunch crowds? We haven't, we haven't shaken out what this is really going to all mean in our new world. Yes, absolutely. But I just want to call out because for those listening at home, for those joining us, uh, via Facebook or whether you're uh, here with us live, the idea of we treat each of our team members as an individual and that we work as a leader to support the individual needs. <laughs> right? This is, this is mind blowing for many of us. And if you're listening at home, I just want you to marinate on that idea for a second. Jason, you shared some experiences like that yourself of really uh, starting to look at an individual level, and you had spoken about the grace that people are starting to give to one another as team members, because you jokingly said, you know, there's a certain amount of grace you give somebody when their dog is walking across the back of the screen or their son is, you know, running past in their diaper. Can you share more about that? Yeah, I mean, I think I think I was speaking sort of about the the kind of ways in which I, as a as a leader um, in my own work, I feel like this period has impacted me personally, and um, you know, I think the 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 way in which we talked earlier about sort of serving our audiences or serving our constituents, um, I think that same kind of perspective applies to leadership at this moment. Um, you know, I feel like if you supervise people or if you run an organization or, or you have sort of influence over people who are, 
who are either working on the front lines or who are, um, you know, who are uh, maybe going to be brought back to the in-person um, work first, you know, before maybe others, maybe they don't do office work. Um, I think that you really have to be quite tuned in to the intellectual, emotional, financial uh, experience of the moment for the people that you that you work with. And, you know, I think a lot of us have have gotten to where we are because we're really good at managing projects and we're really good at getting people motivated to to do work as as we've tr traditionally known it. Um, and this moment, I think, has really tested people's capacity for, to some extent, setting that aside or that those priorities aside in order to take care of the people that you work with. And, you know, that's been something that I've really been kind of reflecting on quite a bit is that, um, you know, when you're, when you've spent the night at a protest and you've been, you, you know, you bear witness to violence against people that you know and people that you care about, it's really hard to get up the next morning and like start doing your, you know, Dilbert activities at your computer, you know, like you need space and you need to process. And it's really helpful to know um, that your organization is aware of that and that your supervisor or that the people you work with are, are providing you that space to experience what you need to experience and go through and process what you need to, um, you know, be before you're expected to kind of get right back to it. And I think, you know, as a cultural organization too, like in, it, you know, since, since the murder of George Floyd, I think we've really paid more attention in terms of the content and, um, and the ways in which that we can be supportive of uh, the protests that really align with our values and supporting, um, you know, the various causes that are associated with Black Lives Matter in a way that, again, is authentic to us and is not just virtue signaling, but is, you know, real for, for the way that um, the fabric of our organization comes together with other organizations in the city. And, um, you know, that has been not so much about, again, like going through all of my priorities that I set up at the beginning of the year to like check all those boxes off. This has been a real, um, you know, realigning of what we've been doing, um, both because our staff and our community kind of expected of our organization and also um, because we believe it's the right, it's the right thing to, to focus on. Um, yeah. And, you know, we're, we're becoming in that process. We're not, we haven't cornered the market. I mean, we fall prey to the same types of institutional racism and patriarchy that many, many museums and, and other cultural institutions do. And, you know, one good outcome of this moment is it's given us a reason to re-examine all of that and to put together the, the planning that it will take to kind of address it in a meaningful way. Wow. Yes. Yes. I love that. We're becoming. We're mm -hmm. becoming. Yes. Um, Michelle Obama reference. Ding. I was going to say, <laughs> as <laughs> Michelle Obama uh, inspires us all to do in her book, um, not a plug, but Michelle Obama, if you would like me to plug your book or your tour, I'd be happy to. Um, you mentioned in terms of thinking about how we realign ourselves, how we invest our energies and our interest into causes that we really believe in. I want to talk now about, you know, for example, single mom of two, one of those people that Louise mentioned who was like, I can't afford to, right? And so I'm thinking, where do I put my money? Um, how do I choose of all of the organizations and causes? I'd love to hear from both of you of how do I choose uh, to align with not only my beliefs, but what's the best way to really look inside an organization and see if 
the work they are doing both in the organization and outside of the organization is consistent with my values? Well, um, you know, that's a question I've, I've really spent a lot of my years thinking about. So mm -hmm. not just right now. I've always believed it was Gloria Steinem who I think years ago said your checkbook should reflect your values. When you open it up and see what you wrote checks to, now we don't write checks much anymore. But um, it is For the millennials out there, a check is exactly. a piece of paper. <laughs> so I think that is a very, very important. And now we have to really relook at that. I mean, there are so many needs. There are the, the immediate needs of food insecurity and, and, make, and, and housing and affordability. But there's also, as we've looked and recognized how much we've all played a part in keeping racism alive. Um, mm -hmm. You know, GSBA is, is a business organization that was founded on the concept of equality is good business. So 40 years ago, before any business was saying, why do I have to care about equality? But we also played a part because for us, what equality probably was much, much more narrow. And we, weren't, we were talking about dismantling systems, certainly of discrimination and barriers, but more probably of, about our own community than the wider community. And over the years, that has changed. But even as we've changed it, have we really dismantled things at the root? So if mm. I'm going to look to donate money, and look, people's money now is very, uh, it's tight. People yes. might have been unemployed. Maybe they got unemployment insurance. They might be furloughed. They might be, you know, we don't know where they are. But I know people are very generous, basically, and they want to give and they want to make a difference. So I think they have to look at, if I really want this world to change, what organizations are working to change the root causes of why we have maintained a system that kept out our black and brown siblings from participating fully in anything. What has it been? How do we really dismantle uh, police departments and, race and uh, the justice system and education and healthcare and business? What part have we all played in keeping a system that was so dysfunctional and based in such unfairness and a lack of recognizing other people's humanity? So I think that's a big job. I hope when people start thinking about that, if they do have children or nieces or nephews, that they bring them around, helping them make that decision. How mm -hmm. can I, is it volunteerism? Is it that I have the benefit of being able to write a check? Small, medium, large, it doesn't really matter. Oh, there's that check again, a credit card, what have you. How can I do that? And I think it's going to take a lot of thought. I don't think it should be just the same old groups you always did, but many groups do good things, don't get me wrong, but which ones are tackling now what you recognize is so essential if we're going to be able to move forward? You know, for us as a business organization, and I think has been a predominantly white business organization, um, even though our board and our staff reflects changes, are we reaching out to businesses owned by communities of color? whether or not they can afford a membership and saying, how can we work together? How can I make sure that the economics of our community is more fairly distributed? What part have I played? Where have I shopped? Where have I uh, hired people? Where, ha you know, and where did the companies that I hire, what did they do with their money? When they use vendors, are they looking for diverse vendors? Mm. Are they looking I mean, there is so, there's such a chain of where we invest and where we don't invest. And we sometimes okay. just look at the surface, but looking further down, how could we have made a different decision or an impact? I do know someone who they were about to hire a contractor and said, do you give any percentage of the money you bring in to anything in the community? And they said, no, not really. And said, you know what? I think I'm gonna make a different decision. Mm. I'm gonna actually only hire companies that give back? What, and who are your employees? If I'm gonna work with a corporation, who's in your C-suite? Who's on your board? Not just entry level jobs. And am I going to really make a difference? So when I'm picking organizations, I wanna see the same thing. If it's education, if it's healthcare, if it's uh, uh, you know, equality issues, 
which are the organizations that are putting on band-aids and which are the ones that are about to dismantle something, shake things up so we can actually make a difference. So I think it's gonna be, um, I think we've never unleashed our power economically the way we could possibly start doing it now. And I think that will make a big difference when our values and our economics start coming together. Yes, yes. You know, because the 500 ideas, you know, I also think that there's this aspect of um, we tend to go along with our values. You spoke about this a little bit last week when we were talking about allyship. We tend to go along with our values until it's just that little bit inconvenient. You know, for example, I even had a moment. Um, I was trying to build raised garden beds. I'd like you all to know that turns out I can work with wood. But, you know, I knew that one of the stores that I uh, normally frequent had just uh, come out with uh, some statements and some actions that very much did not align with my values. And so it was a question, am I gonna drive another 20 minutes down the road in order to get what I know is at this store? Or, you know, and so judging that inconvenience versus that consistency with our values. Jason, what is your opinion for, or your advice for that person who's going, I know that this doesn't really align with my values, but it's easy for me to just donate to this organization. Or, you know, th this is the easy choice as opposed to the one that is consistently doing this work. I mean, that's a, that's a huge question. Um, I'm not sure what my advice would be, except that I do feel like, um, you know, people, people get it. People can tell when an organization or a business is just blowing smoke, where if they're like keeping up with the Joneses by, you know, aligning with, with something. And we, you know, I think we see these critiques every year with respect to pride. It's like, oh, there's another bank or another big business that's marching in the parade with whatever. And, and sometimes, you know, people have real criticisms of that because it seems to have corporatized you know, something that's so much more about, you know, culture and, and values and, and politics. Um, and, you know, so I think it really is on organizations and, and individual businesses to, you know, kind of do the best that they can to interpret whatever they want to say with respect to their values or their commitments to communities or whatever in a way that tells the truth and that is specific around action taking and commitment and isn't, you know, couched in all sorts of vagaries that make it seem like they might be doing something, but we're not really sure. Um, and, you know, I think an, another good sort of litmus test is, you know, what do the people who are directly aligned with that organization, what do they have to say about what it's like there and what and what they talk about when the doors are closed or what they experience when they're in the midst of some activity or program working with that organization you know because it's it's i think it's very easy for people to tell once they dig a little deeper um you know what's like mission related work that's meaningful and authentic and what's like marketing or um you know an attempt to kind of not be called out for maybe not doing something or for doing something in a way that's that's really not making a very strong statement. I think you you know you find this a lot around more politicized issues, um, yes. but I think you know for us as a museum, it's important that you know we because we celebrate pop culture and we're about creativity. Um, it makes a lot of sense for us to align against any kind of violence perpetuated against any community because with every person who we lose um, the opportunity for that person to be a creative individual to contribute to the conversation to make art to be the next musician to be the next filmmaker is snuffed out and that doesn't seem to me to be a question of politics it seems to be a, a, a question of 
you know, whatever the opposite of moral ambiguity is, it's certainty, you know, we need more artists. And when people are, for whatever reason, whether it's race or religious practice or sexuality, um, gender identity, um, you know, every, every person we lose is a person that we don't get to see become a creative participant in our society. And there should be no equivocating about um, where we stand on that. So I think if people are, can look a little deeper into the organizations that they feel aligned to, to sort of see how, it, how it's really functioning in practice, that's a really important um, way to gauge your decisions about investing or, or being a patron or, or, or participating with their, their activities. Yeah, so Jason, I, I was going uh, to add to that. So in terms of violence, yes, but in terms of the movement now that we're all looking at, think how many people, is, you don't have to be killed to be disappeared. And, um, you know, we're certainly, the, the, the deaths recently of George Floyd and others certainly made us think of that. But how many people were just invisible and we lost their talent and their creativity? Um, because it, it, is, it is the same violence, even though the act isn't the same. It is the same violence that, that we have so missed out. And but when you think what a mess we have made of this world, whether it's climate change or not even knowing how to repair a bridge in our own city, I mean, all sorts of things. How many engineers could there have been with maybe more skill and more imagination? And how many problems could we have solved? And what our education system could have looked at when the people who were planning it were, had different perspectives? Yes. Um, you know, I've been thinking a lot about our Constitution lately, and that's not this particular conversation, but this hallowed document that everybody thinks about. And it was created with hardly including anybody. I mean, I, I'm so tired of people thinking this is the most revered document in the world when it was only for white men who owned property. And yes. we try to chip away at it over centuries to say, well, we'll include this person or this person or this person. But in the end, it was never created to include everybody. And so when mm. we say at the root, I say at the very root, we have to start looking at how do we really change things so that everyone is contributing. Because we, the people who are contributing right now have made a mess of it. So I want to see people look at, when they look at the organizations, look at their values, look, look at their, yes, their mission statement and their values, then look at the programs they actually do. And do they include people? Do they, have, they, do they have barriers to their programs? Do they have ways for other people um, to, to get engaged and involved that maybe weren't their original target constituency? Yes. Um, so I think there's a lot of decisions being made, but that to me is the exciting part. That is really where the hope is. Yeah, we are starting to pressure ourselves to take off the band-aids and really start looking at the roots. Yes, oh, I love that, and I think it speaks so much to. Uh, there are some great new studies talking about what represents a digital nonprofit. Prof nonprofits that are really uh, beneficiary centric in that the intended receiver or beneficiary of the work of the nonprofit, what are some of the aspects of that? And one of the things that I always encourage people to think about before they donate to a nonprofit is are the beneficiaries a part of designing the way that the nonprofit works, the solutions that the nonprofit is uh, creating, is wanting to uh, invest their efforts and their donations into. And, you know, it's really telling if none of the beneficiaries are a part of the planning committee, then you've got a big problem there, right? That's when we get into words like what we talked about in our episode um, last week about, um, white uh, ideas or white righteousness around, I know what's best for these communities, as opposed to letting the community lead the discussion and be a part of uh, shaping the mission. And so I wanna finish up today by asking, 
what are some of the young, young nonprofits that you have heard about or that have come across your desk that are getting you really excited right now, who are trying to tackle problems in a new way? Think about it for a second. Well, I do know one organization that uh, we, we do some work with, but it's called Utopia. And um, it's a wonderful group of um, mostly um, Asian Pacific Islander trans women. And they are really reaching out to a group of people who are subjected to a great deal of violence and, um, and yet are often left out of everything from funding and opportunities and programs and i think they're doing some very transformative work um so i um i certainly appreciate appreciate that um and i'll do some thinking i know there's uh one that's about food in schools and how to bring more nutrition in schools and it's feeds i think but i i have to get the exact name of that so there that is actually showing how you can really bring good food to schools because our children are re really fed some cardboard garbage most of the time um yes and so you know jason, people are you fun to some. About that. <laughs> jason how about you gosh um I mean, we work with so many fabulous nonprofits who are doing amazing work, um, but I'll just like hype my friends. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> for that transparency. Uh, my friend Felicia runs an organization called Project Pilgrimage, which is based in Seattle. And um, the model is basically to use the locations of important civil rights moments um, and bring people to those locations on like these incredible trips where uh, at each stop along the way, they meet with historians and artists and um, academics to kind of talk about the, you know, the moments of the civil rights movement and how, um, you know, how they came together. And then they return to Seattle and they do a lot of action planning with the participants to Think about bringing those lessons into the community activism work that they're doing more locally. Um, on the creative front, um, you know, we work very closely with the Vera Project in um, Seattle Center, which is focused on uh, lifting up the voices of, of youth musicians, um, and we partner with them on a number of programs because that's so that's so close to our hearts as well. Um, maybe I'll just out there because I could go on and on and on <laughs> but maybe Louise has come up with a couple more that she could think of well I think I'm you know it's it's a hard thing always when you ask something and and to name things that the uh, uh, when you weren't prepared so I'm not um, I'm not exactly sure but I do like the idea of how much of the population that you're trying to serve to look at that and see who is part of really developing that and and crafting that because I think that's really incredibly important what you mentioned um but i think you know there are you have to also decide what are the areas you want to have an impact in is it environment is it health care um i you know we have an organization project access uh which is to help people who have our low income go see specialist physicians at no cost because most people who are on uh, medicaid and um, or Apple Care through uh, the Affordable Care Act often cannot get to see specialists that they need. So is their health care equitable? And this yes. is a group that helps regardless of your income, especially lowest income, to make sure you get to see a good specialist to deal with your health care issue. So mm. I thought that is a very, uh, that it is more bold and innovative around health care for those who have been underserved. Yes, yes, that was going to be mine. I know um, just in the past uh, couple of weeks, um, Ashley McGirt, who is a local Seattle therapist and a loud advocate for uh, BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, POC mm -hmm. Health, has just created a new fund for a very similar work, Louise, to help raise funds for uh, access to mental health practitioners, 
which is commonly uh, not very accessible mm -hmm. for low-income individuals. So um, I'm also a huge uh, advocate for how do we make sure that we are all having access to the mental health care needs that we might have. And that especially as we navigate this moment right now, I am really encouraging my Black, Indigenous, and POC uh, listeners to make sure that you are taking care of yourself and that mm -hmm. that can be a part of your way of uh, fighting the revolution. Mm -hmm. Louise, you, I want to finish today. You often speak about how we sometimes focus on the word nonprofit as a way to uh, think about putting our money where our beliefs are. But you've also said that we can think about supporting small businesses locally as also a way of doing that same work. Can you finish? Sure. Sometime? I mean, that, that is, of course, where GSBA's roots are. 40 years ago, when uh, nine uh, gay men got together and said, oh, how do we find each other? How do we, when we're not even out, how are we supporting uh, our community? And they decided to form a business organization and base it on equality and put social justice. So we're one of the only business organizations where social justice is part of our mission as well. So when you join, you actually have to be embracing equality for all. You have to have a commitment as a business to do that. But we've always believed, and I think every minority group I know believes that the strength of the community, especially when you're left out, is keeping your dollars in your community. Mm. Um, I know I, I used to talk with our, our board chair at the time, Chinese person, he knew I was Jewish and we're both LGBTQ. And he said, okay, these are the three communities that really know how to keep the dollar in the community. We used to say, keep the pink dollar circulating in the community. And so I think that when you invest in a small business in your own community, that is often the business that will hire people from the community. They're going to donate to the school in their community. They're going to go donate to the nonprofits in their community. So people who are concerned about just big box stores taking everything over, look at the small businesses in your community and see how you can work with them and, and use them because you will find that you're not just going to get a great product and know somebody and support their employment, but you're probably going to be supporting your whole community by doing that. So um, supporting local small businesses uh, does support nonprofits. It does support the economy of a community and it gives you, it, it empowers that community more because if you can keep a community economically healthy, you can also fight for other things for your community. Mm. Um, so I think giving back to small businesses uh, and especially if you could look for women owned, minority owned, LGBTQ owned, veteran owned, businesses that often get very little government support. We're usually left out of everything. And yet those are the small businesses. If you look around right now, COVID-19, and you look at who is feeding, uh, Food is Love program, who's doing the feeding, almost all of those chefs and almost all of those restaurants are women, minority, and LGBTQ owned. Wow. Louise, Jason, thank you so much for joining me on the virtual couch today and helping us keeping it real as we talk about how to invest our beliefs via our dollar um, or sometimes with our feet too. So thank you so much. I'm going to walk away today really thinking about all of the ways that I can even get out of my discomfort in order to really think about the power of my dollar. And I just want to thank you so much for uh, your time. Everyone who's joined us today, I hope that you will drop us some comments and let us know what you're going to be thinking about. Maybe you have some nonprofits that you want to share. And we want to know that you are investing your beliefs with your dollars. See you next week. Thank you. Thank you.